Hey, everybody, what's up? I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be that easy, but uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, use that little silly video to ask you all to do something. Remember, I think it was two Mondays ago, uh, several of us got together for our dinner. Uh, once a month, we get together for our just because dinner. We just hang out, eat, have a good time. Um, we had a great night that night. We played some music that would never be heard in church, but it was good. We had a good time. But one of the things we did is um, I asked everybody that was here, and we had a really good turnout. We, I asked everybody here to just think a moment of somebody that they love, and then also to think about this. Do you love your church? Has it been a blessing to you in, in however many ways, whatever way, you know what I'm saying? made friends, you like the music, you, you learn things, whatever it is that you love about your church. If you feel as though that maybe that person that you love would also enjoy being a part of something like that, if that's something that's missing in their life, take a moment <clears throat> and grab one of these. We passed them out. And I asked them to put their name, that person's name down on this little yellow piece of paper. And then we stuck it inside that cross wall. You know the wall I'm talking about in the lounge? Y'all know what I'm talking about. The people that are watching in the lounge, they know. But you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's what we did. And there's, there's been many names put into that wall. We just like gave it to Jesus and said, all right, Jesus, do this work. Please work in their hearts. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to invite them. So I made a commitment to you that I would pray for those people each and every time that I came to the church. I did my part. I hope that you joined me in that as well. But here's the part that really is most important. If you believe that your church would be a blessing to that person, you have to invite them. Now, if they have been invited a hundred times by you and they've always said no, you didn't have a whole church praying for that first. See, now you do. Okay, so this is the thing. We need you to be bold. We need you to go and re-invite that person. So what I want to do is, if, if you don't mind, Jerry, would you help me? Would you... Would you pass this out? If, if you would like to, to invite someone to church, raise your hand and Jared will give you one of those. And you can use that as an invitation to have them come and join you at your church. But here's, here's, the, here's the next thing I want to suggest. And they touched on it at the end of the video. If you really want them to come, offer to pick them up. Offer to pick them up. If you come to their house and say, not only would I like for you to come and, and check out my church, but I would like to come pick you up, you'll have a much better chance of them saying yes. So I want to encourage you to do that. Grab that invitation, give it to them, talk to them about your church, invite them this week, and offer that you will pick them up Saturday evening and bring them to your church. Is that cool? All right. Um, now, the next thing, if, if um, okay, there, there's group of people here at this church that, that are devoted, wonderful people. They help teach the children. They teach the children upstairs. They, they, they watch the babies. They watch the toddlers. But I know this is hard to believe, but there's some attrition. Not everybody feels led to do that all the time. Can you imagine that? I don't know why, but they just don't want to do that all the time. And so sometimes, believe it or not, there are names that fall off the schedule for watching the kids. So there's, I'm just going to say this, there's a deficit now. And so um, consider this, if you'd like to help out once a month in any of these rooms, we want to help you. We want to help you uh, plug in to your church and be a blessing to the family that you're called to by God. So this is what we're going to do. Next week, uh, the, the people that are involved already there's a new schedule that needs to be made. And then if you feel like you want to help out, we want to invite you all, those that help and all those that want to help, to meet next week before the service at 5 upstairs. So the new schedule can be made. If you have any questions, any concerns, whatever. That, if you want to help out in that area of this ministry, We'd like to see you here next week at 5 o'clock upstairs before the service begins. Jared, thank you for sending those out. I also want to point out, we made these for many reasons. One, it's to give someone information about what we are. But on the back, I'd like to welcome you to grab one of these each and every week when you come in because on the back, it gives you an opportunity to write down some notes about what you've heard. Maybe some uh, scripture references can be listed there. And then perhaps what your next move is. 
What's your next step? When you hear God's word proclaimed, maybe there's a next step in your walk of faith. Maybe it's to actually say yes to Jesus and get saved. Maybe it's to be baptized. Maybe it's because you want to help out in the ministry in some way. I don't know what you're feeling, what God's going to say to you each and every week, but there's a great place to put it down in writing. And sometimes when you do that, it just sticks a little bit more. Okay, and then last but not least, if you're, if you're new, I think there's only one face here, but if you're new and you'd like to find out a little bit more about the church, on the um, bookcase out there in the hallway before you walked in, there's a little thing called a connection card. You can fill it out and put your name and number on there. We'll get in, in touch with you and, and, you know, maybe you have some questions about Jesus. Maybe you have some questions about this church. Uh, maybe you have questions about the Bible. I don't know, but we want to help you in any way that we can. So please uh, fill one of those things out and drop it into one of the offering boxes by the doors. All right. Um, enough of that. I'm going to pray with you real quick, and then we're going to jump into our Bibles. Uh, Lord, I, God, I thank you uh, for all that you've done here already this, this evening. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and to present your word. It's a tremendous uh, heavy burden to, to, to take the word of God, the most important thing left here on this earth for us. Like we, it's the words of God, and to be able to pass it on to people um, so that you might have your will in their life done. It's just a tremendous, tremendous blessing, but it's a lot of weight. In my, but I do appreciate it. I thank you for letting me have the opportunity to, to do it. It gives me meaning in my life. Lord, I pray that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit now to um, open up our hearts to receive uh, your word. Uh, lead us into all truth. Help us to glean things from your word tonight that we may have not have seen before. Help our, our house here to be a house of love, understanding, um, tolerance, tolerance, Lord. Let there be tolerance in this room. Let us love one another better. Help us to not seek to find our own way to be right, but to be effective for you, for the advancement of your kingdom. I thank you and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospel. What is the Gospel? Who is the Gospel for? What is man's condition without the Gospel? And what is man's fate without the Gospel? Why do we need the gospel? The gospel is a great mystery to many. In his book to the Romans, the great apostle Paul provides clear answers to all of man's questions about God and about himself. Welcome to the HD Gospel. All right. All right, uh, let's, let's grab our Bibles. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Uh, page number should be up on the screen where we're going to be. Please uh, make sure you get your eyes on a copy of God's Word. If you don't have one, just grab one of the orange or the yellow ones, and the page number should correspond. Let's hope. Uh, the Bibles that we have, they've had many, many drafts made over the years, and so they keep coming out with new ones, and on the back there's a number. And so some of them, they might look the same, they might not match exactly to the number on the screen, but it would be a page or two at most from where you see on the screen. So bear with me if some of those found their way from the bookcase onto the seats. Give me some grace there, please. <coughs> um, this, this week we're in Romans chapter 8, and uh, we get to this, this. It's really a neat section of Scripture. It's highly contested. It's um, very controversial, but it's, it's packed with goodies. Um, I just want to kind of show you something here. In the beginning of, of chapter 8, you see um, these first two words in, in chapter 8. And it's so now. So now. Um, he's about to give us some reality. He's about to give us some truth. But see, it's based on, these words so now mean that it's based on everything he said leading up to this point. Do you see what I'm saying? And so uh, today I want to just dive into this thing and, and explain this new reality he's about to share with the people in Rome, the people here at Revolution Church. One of the things that we want to do with this series called the HD Gospel is to clearly define what the gospel is so you know what's saving you, you know how to pass it on to other people. And one of the best ways to study the gospel is not only to study what it is, but you study what it's not. Because if, when you study what it's not, you kind of cut through all the stuff people make up. 
You know what I'm saying? All these wacky things that people uh, believe are the gospel, but they're really not. I'm just going to kind of pick on one thing, um, not too aggressively, but I'm going to pick on this one thing. You, ever, you guys know the serenity prayer? The serenity prayer is a good prayer. Like, I'm not knocking the serenity prayer, but there's a lot of people out there that are wondering, where in the Bible is that? Do you ever wonder that, right? It's not. It's not. It's good stuff but it's not in the Bible, right? So what we want to do is we want to just give you a clear definition, clear understanding of what the gospel is, and again, what the gospel's not, so that you can understand it with some clarity. And that's what Paul's trying to do here. So he's in chapter 8, and he says, so now, so now. So like I said, he's about to give you some reality, some truth. And what that means is everything I've said prior to this, I'm now going to take all that information and I'm going, to t- I'm going to base a truth on that. So what he's saying is, that, so now we realize that God created all things and everybody has seen it. And so nobody is with excuse. Everyone should know that there's a God. Everyone should acknowledge that there's a God. Everyone should worship this God, but no people do. Everyone suppresses it in their unrighteousness. And they come up with all these new religions and laws Some people just kind of function with God on their own subjective conscience. They have all these rules and regulations. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. They start worshiping the creation instead of the creator. Hey, this is a good steak. This is some good bacon. Sorry, Katie. Oh, she's upstairs. I can do that. But instead of saying, oh, this is a good steak. This is good bacon. Man, what a beautiful sunset you take that and you say, oh, that is, but who made it? See, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just let our worship end on the thing. We're supposed to have our worship end on the creator of the thing. And that's what he wants of us, but we don't do that. And so he says, all of us are just bad. He gives a universal um, ruling, and he says, every one of us is bad. No one is good. No one's seeking God. No one is righteous, not even one. That every single person on earth is guilty before God. You've all sinned actively. You've all sinned passively because Adam and Eve sinned and they passed it down generation after generation to you. And so it's in your DNA. It's just everybody. But, he says, God made a way. Because we've tried all these ways and it's not working. Right? And so God says, but I, I, I make a way. And so the way is that you just need to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son, the perfect God-man, the fullness of deity that dwelled in this man, that he comes down and he sheds his blood on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sin, to pay for your active sin, to pay for your passive sin, your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin. All sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He made a way. Hey, you got it. Just for the record, I really like when you do that. I'm just saying, I'm not a rich man, makes me wealthy. Amen. I'm just throwing it out there, okay? I'm just throwing it out there. So, so now the, the Bible goes on in Romans, Paul's like, okay, now, not, not only has he made a way, but here's the thing, you just have to believe and trust that, that because of what he did, you're going to be with him forever. You need to trust in that. And don't go trusting in that for your salvation, but then giving up on that and seeking your own way again, your own religion, your own human effort to get perfect before him so you can get better and you can become more like him, kind of earn your salvation further. No, it starts with faith, it continues with faith, and it ends with faith in Jesus' work on the cross, and that's it. You have to believe and trust that forever nothing ever changes so now here's the thing Paul's he, he this is an awesome awesome letter I love this guy I love Paul right because he's so real right now you read all this stuff that I've just said out loud all right and we've gone through week after week in detail but Paul is like um now I'm a Christian we all agreed that he's a Christian right that he's going to be at the wedding supper of the lamb he's got his name on a little tag the head table, right? We all said that. You all agreed, right? Don't leave me up here. You all agreed, right? Okay, so he's a Christian, but what he says is now, I'm reading all the stuff about sin being broken and all that, but I'm a total bust. We talked about this last week, like the whole idea of Christian being perfect. They, all of a sudden when you say, you bend the knee to Jesus and you say, yes, Lord, I'm yours, that all of a sudden you're such a different person that you're perfectly behaved in all ways and you act just like Jesus 
all the time. And Paul's like, that is so not real. I am like top dog Christian. And let me just tell you about my life. I know God's law, and I cannot keep it. I know what I should do because it's right, but I don't. I know the things I shouldn't do, but I always do it. Who can save me from this miserable life that is dominated by sin and death? Oh, the answer is in Jesus Christ. And he calls himself a slave of sin. Now, wait a minute. This is confusing to me. This is very confusing to me. Do you know that in one of the letters Paul wrote that as to the law, I kept it perfectly? And now he's telling us that he's a slave to sin, that he knowingly and willingly breaks God's commands all the time, that he's a slave to sin. In, in chapter 6, th- uh, 6, thir- uh, 6, 16 or 6, 13, somewhere in there, he says that, don't you know that, that whoever you choose to obey come, becomes your master? And he calls himself at the end of 7 a slave of sin. Women, you, you, you said that as to the law you kept it perfectly, but yet you're telling us now, the same dude, that I knowingly and willingly said yes to sin. I'm a slave to sin. Now, how many in the room right here, honestly, feel more perfect or closer to Paul? Here's Paul over here. Raise your hand. Right? Don't you dare say perfect. Uh, Robert finally put his hand up. I was got to get on you, dude. Right? <laughs> right? That's us. And so when the scriptures say that the scripture itself is here to encourage you and bring you hope, I think Paul does that. But I'm confused still. How can he tell me, how can you tell me you keep the law perfectly, and in another writing you say that I'm a slave to sin and I don't keep it well at all? You know what he is? He's like the rest of us. He's a hypocrite. You hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. The rest of these seats are reserved for the other hypocrites that are soon to come. We're all hypocrites, right? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And Paul is a hypocrite. An absolute hypocrite. I don't understand that. You know what else the Bible says? This is really confusing too. This is really weird. Do you know that the Bible itself speaks about Paul's writing as confusing? Peter said that. He said it in, in the, the reference to 2 Peter 3.16. You could check it out if you want to sometime. But he says that the writings of Paul are very difficult to understand. I'm getting that. I'm so getting that, right? I'm more, so forget Paul. I'm Peter. I, I'm not even Paul. I'm, I'm Peter. I can't even understand Paul, right? I can't even understand Paul. So, so here's the thing. I'm going to do my very best, right? I'm not, I'm not the gospel. Do you guys understand? I'm not the gospel, okay? The gospel is here. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the gospel of Moses. It's the gospel of Paul. It's not the gospel of Peter. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. Go find it. Go find it, okay? But I'm going to do the best I can. I went digging, and I found some stuff, and I wanted, I'd like to share it with you if that's okay. But if you don't agree with me, which is often, <laughs> don't throw anything. Just don't throw anything, right? We do this thing on Sunday night. You can throw stuff then. You know what I'm saying? But don't throw stuff now. Okay, so let's do this. Let's read a little bit. Romans chapter 8. I sent a video out on Facebook the other day, and I told you that if you get to a section of Scripture you've read a hundred times, don't, don't, don't like brush it off and go to the next one and go, you know, I don't know that one. I want to learn something new. You will. I've read this, sec- I'm not, like I, like I said in the video, I'm not tooting my horns, trying to sound like all super religious guy, you know what I'm saying? But if you look, like, you know I've read that section a lot, right? You got to all kinds of, okay, I've probably read it a hundred times in my life, and I read it this week, new stuff, new stuff. I'm going to share the new stuff with you, okay? So don't just breeze by the Bible thinking, oh, I know that. It's only John 3.16, I know that one. Okay, so here we are in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 1. And this, ch- this verse right here, this first verse is like a mountain in Scripture. You know, there's some famous ones, right? There's some real super famous ones like, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. 4, uh, For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, you know, 
You get John 3, 16, Romans 8, 28. That's everybody's favorite because we want things to work out. God will work all things out for the good to who know the, uh, I can't even say it. It's a mountain. For God, we know that God will work things, all things out to the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. I get it right. Romans 8, 28. All right, these, are the, these are the mountains of Scripture, the famous ones, right? These are the ones that are on coffee cups, on T-shirts, they're on bumper stickers, and we throw them around a lot. We use them flippantly. We don't really know what they mean, but we say them because they sound good. So we take a verse and we fit it into whatever situation that we are in so that we can try to put a fix to it. And I, and I do that too, and I do it with this one all the time. And I'm not going to do it anymore, I hope, God willing. But after I read this, I know that I shouldn't do what I do. Okay, here we are. So now... Based on everything that I've told you, people, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save, to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control. There's a big word there, control. It's used seven times in the, in the, just in the short text that we're sharing tonight, the word control. Um, in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the Spirit. <clears throat> Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your, spirit, by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Mary, let's hear it. There you go. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. <clears throat> you could literally talk a month straight about this stuff. And so this week's been weird. And it's weird right up to this very moment because I don't exactly know what I'm going to talk to you about. Usually I study a lot. and I come up with about six. It's weird. I do six or seven pages of notes every week. But this week I have one. I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm just trusting in God. <laughs> I'm trusting in God. What is this, what is this so there's no condemnation in Christ even mean? See, I, I've used it flippantly. You know what I use it for? Someone does something wrong. And they start beating themselves up about it, right? So what do I say? Hey, brother, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. You should just get over it. God forgot it. You should too. Anyone else? Come on now, right? I'm not the only one who's ever said that, right? A couple of us, five, six, seven. Is, is that what it is? Oh, man. It, does it mean that you're never naughty? Does it, does it mean that you're not to blame for what you did? Does it mean you're not supposed to feel rotten about your bad choices? See, I don't know. I mean, the Bible says that, uh, that godly sorrow leads to repentance. The Bible says that if you feel rotten about what you did in a good way, like, hey, God, that's not what I was supposed to do. You know, I do feel kind of crappy about it, but you know what, God, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to do better. That's good. It's not to take you. This, this phrase here, this little coffee cup verse, this is not to get you off the hook so you don't have to feel bad about what you did. If you did something bad, you should feel bad about it but it should lead you to change. Not to just sit there and wallow and feel bad and oh, woe is me, I suck. No, 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 no. It's to lead you to repentance, right? To lead you to change. That's what God uses. He tightens it down on you, makes you feel a little crappy about it so that you'll change. You know what I'm saying? That's what he's trying to do. 
If you look up the, this is a confusing section of scripture because he uses these words and the, and, and I don't know, it's like the same word and it's different meanings and different contexts and it's weird. He uses the word death so many times in this thing and control and it always means something different but it's weird. So you got to kind of like spend time and you got to look it up in the concordance and figure out what this confusing guy Paul is actually trying to say so you can understand what the gospel really is. Because if you don't understand what the gospel really is and you impose some superficial made up gospel to Jesus, when it fails you, and it will, say it will, you will think God failed you. And so you got to try to, to, to bury into this thing and find out what in the world he means. Okay? You look up condemnation it's not just like there's no condemnation like it's not like uh there's no not feeling bad about yourself you shouldn't take the heat on this don't take the blame that's not what he means if you look over that same word condemnation is in romans chapter 5 where it says that because of adam's sin it brought condemnation to everyone do you know what that means we're all damned let me ask you a question. In this church, can we be different than other churches? You know what, in other churches, you're not supposed to like talk about heaven and hell. You're not supposed to say someone's going to, you can say someone's going to go to heaven, but you never say someone's going to go to hell because that's like, that's not nice. I don't, I don't know how to sugarcoat stuff and I don't want to fake and try to be someone that I'm not. So when it talks about condemnation, it means that at the moment your mom and dad conceived you, you have the sin of Adam in your DNA and you're damned. All across the earth, everyone, that's where you're going, hellbound. But God made a way. And that's what he's saying. He's not saying, oh, you messed up, you shouldn't feel bad about it. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you're not naughty. He's not saying you're not wrong. You are wrong, you are naughty, you are guilty of sin. But, listen, God made a way. So you don't go to hell, you go to heaven. That's what it means about no condemnation in Christ. He's not taught, when he's talking about control, he's not saying that somehow, some way, that because I'm a Christian, that the Holy Spirit now dwells in me, and now I'm going to act perfect in all my decisions and, and my attitude, my perspective changes, I'm going to be totally different in everything I say and do. My behavior is going to be perfect, just like Jesus. No. That's not what control means. What it means is he's controlled. Sin used to control your destiny. Do you know what I'm saying, right? Because of the sin in you, you were destined for hell. But God made a way. And so now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, sin no longer has control over your destiny so your ultimate the ultimate control for the for the eternity of jamie is heaven do you understand what i'm saying the eternity of joey is heaven there's some power and confidence in living a life knowing that no matter what happens between the time you bow your knee to the time you draw your last breath that you're going to be in glory anyway there's confidence in that you can live free you can live with some victory you can live with no fear when you know that no matter what happens, your destiny is sealed because of what Jesus Christ did. That's good preaching. Let me hear it. Do you know what I'm saying? But that's true. That's true. Okay, control doesn't mean control over your moment-to-moment -moment attitudes and your choices. Control means control over your destiny. Over your destiny. Sin no longer is, is, is the last player in the play of your life. Death is no longer the last scene in your life. That although you die, you live. Do you see? Because of what Jesus Christ did. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross doesn't mean that you're not naughty. That doesn't mean you're not acting like a creep half the time. That doesn't mean you're not like Paul, a complete hypocrite. Still all those things. Let's just get it into the light, man. Let's not be phony, some happy-go-lucky Christians that everything's all fine and happy because there's nobody in this room that I know none of you are that way. No one is all happy and peachy all the time. I'm not happy and peachy ever. I almost quit. I almost quit you guys. An hour before the service started, I was pissed at every one of you. But Jesus, right? I was pissed off at everybody. I just was. Don't make me go into a rant, dude. That's not going to be godly. 
It's not going to work. Don't even open the door for me. It's, I'm, I've been up all night. I got a cold. I got allergies. I've been coughing like crazy. I'm not happy. But you know what? I made a commitment. Here I am. Hmm. Hmm, no, not good for me. I suck. <laughs> there ain't nothing good. I'm like Paul. There ain't nothing good in me. I know. I know there's nothing good in me. Okay, so let's just, yeah, he's good. He's good. Seth's friend's never coming back to this church. Okay, so um, <laughs> let, let's just read on here. Let's just, let's just unpack what this says. He'll try to, I just want to learn stuff about God and let his, let his word build faith in us. That's what it says it'll do. You hear his word, builds faith. So here it goes on that um, it says that the, that the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now, Again, when I read this many, many times before, I'm thinking, okay, this life-giving spirit is in me and it's freed me from the power so that sin's not gonna allow me to uh, make me sin anymore. I'm not gonna sin anymore because, but I'm like Paul, I understand that, yeah, okay, get the Holy Spirit in me, but like I'm totally sinning like crazy all the time. What's going on here? And you get ticked off because you think, why hasn't things changed? Like, why aren't I more like my grandmother or my grandfather was? They were like super Christian or the guy across the street or this pastor on TV that's always smiling all the time. Why? Why don't I like that guy all the time? Because I'm just regular, right? And Paul's like, yeah, I'm a regular guy too. Like, I really love God. He said, I love God's law, but I can't keep it. Who's going to keep it for this miserable life? Ugh! Like, I'm that guy. I'm that guy. But here's the problem. We think that if we, like, try to be good, it's going to work. And he goes on to say that that's not going to work. He says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. You know, this is kind of crazy, but in Deuteronomy 6, this is what God says in his word to his people. And if you keep all my rules, if you, if you, let, let's just call it what it is, if you're perfect. Because he's got a set of rules, right? This is the way God says a man or a woman should live. And so if we do exactly as he says, that's perfection. Right on the mark, right? Right on the mark. He says in Deuteronomy 6, you can check it out. Right at the end of the chapter, the last thing he says, if you keep all my rules, I will consider you righteous. Man, you know how many thousands of years? I don't even know when that was written exactly. But you know how much time's gone by? A lot. Smart. What's your radio show? Tell people about it. Why not? Why not plug your radio show? I've never, I've listened to it once. You talked to me. What? Trip, you guys all know Trip. See, some of you don't even know Trip. He's part of your revolution family. Look at his arm. Stand up a second. Come on. I know you don't like this. Nobody likes to be. Show everybody your tattoo. You see that? Okay. So now you get, now you see where we got our idea. Okay, Trip, what, tri tell us about your radio show. Tell us. Tell us what it is. It, whatever, dude. It's, you know what? It's from your heart, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Go ahead. What is it? Uh, Post-politics. Mm -hmm. J-Rev Radio. Mm -hmm. When is it on and how do we hear it? Sundays and Wednesdays from 9 to 11. How do we hear it? You got uh, the TuneIn app. You can go directly to the websites and pops Okay, he's got his own radio show. If you would like to hear it, just see him before he leaves. Just see him before he leaves, okay? He, he, he likes to express his, his views on politics and stuff like that, world events. And he's got a position on things. He's got a strong position on things. He's passionate about those things. And he likes to share them with the world because that's, in his heart, that's the way he brings beauty to the world because he wants to share his heart. So if you'd like to participate in that, see him before you leave, okay? Um, all right, where was I? Okay, so... It says in Deuteronomy 6 that if you keep all my rules, I'll consider you righteous. So that would be good, right? We'd be righteous. We'd be perfect. And, and those are the perfect people that get to go to heaven with God, right? Here's the thing. It says here in, in our text in Romans chapter 8 that the law of Moses was unable to save us. Not because it wasn't spiritual and good. It was awesome. But why? Because of our sinful nature, we're unable to keep the law. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body. Okay, his, he sent his son in a body. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in the human form of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not born or created the day in the manger. He existed before time. 
And, and God sent him in a body to this earth to do what the law of God could not do. So he sent his son in a body like the bodies we have, right? And in that body declared an end to sin's control. There it is again. It's kind of weird. An end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. But see, now again, it goes on. It's, well, first of all, it's confusing because I'm thinking, okay, sin doesn't have control over me anymore, so that means I should be able to act righteous and pure all the time, right? But I'm not. And so this word control is kind of weird. It's a weird word because when you hear the word control, like I don't know about you, but I think of remote control toys. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got my first remote control toy. It was a little, it was a Sherman tank. I got it from Radio Shack in, in, the, in the mall up in Massachusetts where I grew up. And I thought that was the most fascinating thing. Like, nowadays, they're a dime a dozen. But I got this little Sherman tank, and it was, it was amazing, right? It, would, it had these little uh, rubber, you know what I'm saying? It would crawl up over everything. It could, like, climb up a wall like a demon. The thing was amazing, right? It was awesome. But it was cool because, like, if I pushed forward, guess what? The thing went forward. When I pressed left, guess what? It went left. You're brilliant, right? It was, I had control over that thing, right? So when I, you know, I, you know what I really want? I've never had, I want a remote control helicopter. Those are cool, right? I would love to have, who's ever had a remote control helicopter? Are they cool? Are they? Did you break it the first, the maiden voyage? You have one? You come over the house and play with it. We're like little kids. I want to play with your toy. Yes, that is so cool. I want to. I'm doing it. Yes, I'm doing it. Will that motor break? No, I'm sorry. Never mind. Um, okay, so see, it's been a while. People forget. That's good. Okay, so, so, so here's the thing. It's, it's not like that. Like I thought it was cool because now I have control. Like if I say left, it goes left. If I say right, it goes right. If I say back, back. You know what I'm saying? Like I have control. And so when I'm reading this, I'm like, okay, so the Holy Spirit has control of me. But... I'm like Paul, like I can't stop sinning, I'm a big boss, like I don't get it. Okay, so uh, he explains it. It's not that he has control, like he's dictating what you do. He did this, that means sending his son in a body like ours to pay, to end sin's control, reiterating that our destiny has changed. He said he did this so the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. And that's what we talked about last week. There's two things required by the law. You've got to do it, and then when, when, when you break it, you've got to pay, right? This is, this is the punishment. Something's got to bleed. And so he does that. He fulfills the justice end of the law by paying the penalty for, you, for your sins, past, present, and future, and for all people. Now, it's kind of weird. He kind of shifts gears here. In verse 5, let me just kind of read this again. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So now he's not talking about so much like behavior. He's, thinking, he's talking about thoughts. You know? Thoughts. So I read this again. Here I am totally confused. I don't know if you are, but I'm a simple guy, and I'm confused because it says here, Dominated by the sinful, okay, the people that are dominated by the sinful nature, I'm th they think about sinful things, but the, thing, but the people that are dominated or, or controlled by the Holy Spirit, they think about things that please the Spirit. Well, I'm a Christian, right? Anyone else in here a Christian? Couple, right? It's cool, right? How many of us are walking around all day and night, you know, you wake up, the first thing out of your, in your thought life is, man, I just can't wait to share the gospel with someone today. Man, I'm just, I can't, you know what, like, listen, how many people are like, Man, I can't wait for that offering basket to come by. I can't wait to share my faith. I can't wait to go on this mission trip. I can't wait to feed the homeless people. I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait for, Jesus is good, like all the, who's thinking about that stuff all the time? No, I'm not. I'd like to tell you that I am. You know, if I was able to hook a, a, a USB cord to your heads, each and every one of you, and put it up on the screen, that'd be kinky. That'd be kinky. 
<laughs> Those are definitely thoughts of the sinful nature, right? <laughs> oh, poor candy, look at it. Maybe she could get the camera around over here, buddy. That'd be sweet. <laughs> you know, at least that they're sharing the load now. It's not just me being a pervert now. Now it's Jared, too. So that's good. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you. He'll be preaching next week. <laughs> that's the prerequisite around here. Total perv. You're in. Let's go. I ordain you right now. Awesome. Yeah, if we could do that, right? Like, nobody, I don't care who you are, right? No one's just walking around thinking about evangelism and planting churches like 24-7. Yeah, you make fun of me and stuff because you know I'm kind of crazy like that, but I'm not thinking about it all the time. Like, I could be thinking about it so strongly that it makes me get mad at you guys. So I was going to quit like an hour before here, right? That's not, that's not led by the Spirit, right? I want to quit. I hate you all, right? That's it. That's, that is not of the Spirit, right? Right, so nobody is feeling that way all the time. No one's feeling all, that way all the time. So, and, and you know what? Paul's like that. So, so find hope. I want you to understand the real gospel. The, go, the real gospel is not to be perfect now. Okay, because, because, because Paul, it says here, this same guy who says that when the Spirit controls your mind, you're thinking about the things that please the Spirit. Well, he, is he thinking about things that please the Spirit all the time? I mean, he knows that he's supposed to do good, but he's choosing. He said, I choose, knowingly, willfully, choose to follow that, li you know, the little angel and the devil on the shoulder thing? That's not really biblical either, but it kind of is. Because there's a war going on. Like, it's, it's there. It's happening all the time. And you know what? So if this is the devil over here, Paul's telling us in chapter 7, I choose him. I'm a slave to sin. I willfully choose to follow him. That's Paul. Doesn't that give you some hope? That maybe you're okay after all? That maybe you're not some whack job? And you don't, you know, don't want to like openly confess that at, at, around other Christians because it might make you look bad? I'll tell you what, it'll make you look real. And I'd like to have a church where people can just do that. Just come in and say, hey, I'm a total bust. I'm a total wreck. I want to do this, but I can't. I don't want to do that, but I do. You know what God's after? He's not after your, your do's and don'ts. He's after this. He's after you not wanting to do bad anymore. He's after you wanting to do good. The law makes you fear and makes you not want to do bad because you're fearful, okay? But the Spirit changes you so you don't want to break the rules anymore because you are responding with love and gratitude to this amazing Savior that came down from heaven in the body of Jesus to the cross when he didn't have to to pay for your sin and you go wow that's insane crazy love and I just want to respond to that and I don't want to disappoint you anymore Lord the Bible says that if you love me you keep my commands and so it's the love that drives you to keep his commands not fear and guilt it's the love and that's what he's working on you know life in the spirit isn't always like peachy and bunnies and unicorns and, and, you know, golden streets and Willy Wonka and all that kind of good stuff, right? It's not. Life in the Spirit is not all that peachy and wonderful. It's a war. It's a war. It's kind of weird here. I want to read something out of our text. Just, again, I don't really have a whole lot of notes, so I'm just kind of going along here and sharing what I learned. Um, this whole idea of this being controlled by the Holy Spirit and your thoughts, look, look, look what it says. It, sh it shines some light on this whole idea of control. It's not a remote control car. The Holy Spirit's not living inside of you saying, this is what you're going to do, and you go, yes, sir. That's not what it is. You're, she's not a Sherman tank who just goes left and right and up and down. Yeah, that's not control. What does it say about control? Look at verse 9. But you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Do you see? So again, control is not about your moment-to-moment -moment decisions. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, one, it says you are one of His, so you're a Christian, and two, your destiny is controlled. Not your moment-to-moment. -moment. You're still Paul. I keep screwing up. I want to do better. 
Repent, move on. But your destiny is under his control. And it says not that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are controlled by him. I mean, I didn't make that up. You read it, right? Does anyone disagree? I mean, you read it, right? Just verbatim, right? Okay, that's what it says. Um, it says this too. Um, and those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to get sideways here for a moment and just speak briefly about this idea of a separate time when you get the Holy Ghost. Okay? I think that's bogus. I think that's bogus. I think that the moment, Ephesians 1.13, the moment you bend the knee to Christ and say yes and let him into your life as Lord and Savior, it says he gives you his Holy Spirit. And so if this is true right here that if you do not have the Spirit of Christ living in you, you do not belong to him, then there cannot be a period of time, whether it be a day, a second, or, or a month, or a year, or ten years, that you can say yes and be a Christian, but not yet receive the Holy Spirit. Because if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not a Christian. Now, can you be overwhelmed where at, in moments of time where he just, just gets you fired up and you like go from someone who doesn't ever want to say anything about Jesus to like, let me tell you about my best friend Jesus Christ. Yes. Can there be times when all of a sudden the person who just every day all, and all of a sudden he's speaking in another language and it's because the people in the room here are French and they need to hear French and I don't know French but I start speaking French. Yeah, that's crazy, right? But it happens. You know why? Because his book says so. It does happen. There are times when the Holy Spirit of God swells up in you and just kind of kind of takes over, but he gives you boldness to do things you wouldn't normally do. Yes, but you cannot tell me that there's a time when you go from being a Christian to the time you get the Holy Ghost because the Scripture tells us that if you do not have him, you do not belong to him. So at the moment of conversion, Holy Spirit dwells in you. It goes on to say something about the sinful nature being hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never... I'd kind of unpack that a little bit too. There's two ways you can please God or two ways you cannot please God. One, if you're sinning, show of hands... Does that please God? Okay. That's a no-brainer, right? Everyone knows that one. Don't need to go to seminary for that, right? But here's the other one. Talking about pleasing God. Pleasing God, let me give you a couple of references here. How, 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 can you, how, can you, how can you please God? Well, God, this is how God feels about you. 1 Timothy 2.4, he says that he wants all to be saved. He, wants, he doesn't want anybody going to hell. He wants everybody to be with him forever. Now he displays this truth in detail in Hebrews 12 too, where, where it says of Jesus, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. Like going to the cross would, if, 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 could we just use this term? It would totally suck. Like it would suck. It would, it would, it, you, you'd be up there naked. See, in the movies they don't show it like it really was. Most often they were naked, right? Here's this guy who was like the leader of this big movement. And, and people might not have believed that he was God in the flesh, but he's an important dude at very least, right? So here he is, stretched out, spread eagle, naked in front of everybody. People are spitting at him, cussing him out, throwing stuff at him. He's embarrassed, he's naked, he's stretched, he's hurting. It, it, the wrath of, of, of Almighty God is poured into the soul of Jesus Christ because of what we've done all at one time. Like how much that would hurt, like crazy, right? All that, and he, and he said, you know what? Because of that, I'm okay because of the joy awaiting me. What was the joy awaiting him? You, no. You know what the joy awaiting him was? You. You're the joy awaiting him. 
You're the joy awaiting him. Because back in the garden, Adam sinned and, and severed the relationship where now everyone's destined for hell. But he endured the cross because of the joy awaiting him. You'll be there with him. What was not going to be is now going to be. And that was what the joy was inside of Jesus. He didn't need to do all this stuff, but he wanted to be with you. And we messed it up and jacked it up so bad. So he went to the cross, endured the pain and the shame because of the joy awaiting him. And so if we are led by the sinful nature, you know, just totally abandoning God, worshiping things that he made rather than the one who made it, doing our own little religions and our own subconscious, subjective conscious, and we're not acknowledging him, if we follow that nature, we're going to be hellbound. That doesn't please him. He wants to be with you forever. He loves you. The Bible says that you are the crown jewel of all of his creation. And he wants to be with you. So we jack it up. He fixes it on the cross at Calvary. That's the joy awaiting him. And so that's what it says. If you're following the sinful nature and you don't say yes to the finished work of Christ on the cross, it's not going to please him if his loved ones are in hell. He's not going to like that. And so if we follow our sinful nature, that's our future. And he doesn't like that. Life in the Spirit is not peachy. Life following the Spirit's guide is not easy. Don't let anybody kid you and tell you that it is, because it's not. I don't know a single Christian that can tell me that their life is easier now. It may be an inner thing that says, you know what, I've seen the end of my story and it's all going to work out and so I can live with some peace in that. But it's not easier. Do you know the Christian's cars still break down? Yes. Yes, I do. do you know that Christians still get cancer? Do the Christians still get in car wrecks? Do the Christians still get their houses foreclosed because they lost their job? Do the Christians have companies that close and their, their 401s are just, what? What happened to my 401k? Where is that? It happens to us all. Everybody gets it. But when you know the end of the story, you can see past the dissolved 401k retirement plan. Do you know what I'm saying? Like 2007, 2008, when it all burst, like a third of the nation's wealth was gone in a day. Like insanity. What was it? You know what it really was. Well, yeah, I was about to say a third of my wealth was gone. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. You were a Christian back then, right? Why though? Shouldn't his life be controlled by the Holy Spirit? I shouldn't let that happen. Why would it happen to a Christian? Not me, Lord. Life in the Spirit is not easy. Let me. I, I, I alluded to it earlier. Life in the Spirit is a freaking war. It is a war. See, what you don't see right now is what's going on in the heavens right now. It's the stuff that people make movies about that pay money to go watch. You don't need to. You're in one. You're in the Lord of the Rings. Okay? Middle Earth is right here. That was good, right? Yeah. That wasn't in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Like, it's going on right now. It just be, it, there's, th listen, there's no control as, the, as we would think, like a remote control car about, uh, with the Holy Spirit on your life. He's not controlling every single thing that you do. He's in you. He's going, Ben, Ben, would you just, because he wants what's best. Romans 8, 28, things working out. He's trying to work it out for you. Right, but, but do we listen? Does Paul Okay, does Frank, does Dan, no. Meredith, oh no. No, I'm just kidding. I love you. She's hot, so it's okay. She doesn't have to do what he says, right? Shall amen, amen? Yeah, okay. Take that off. Ed you got editing, right? Life in the spirit is a war. He doesn't have control over you, 
Like we might think when we read this stuff that I can just kind of lay down my guard and he's going to control my actions, thoughts, choices, and it's going to all work out good. No, it's a war. Do me a favor and, and turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. I'm almost done. Do, 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 do. Whoop. Galatians chapter 5. You need to have clarity as to what, you know, this life with the Holy Spirit is. Really? Verse 16. It's where the rubber meets the road right here. So I say, the same guy, this is Paul, same dude. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. You see the difference? You see, see how the words change there? It's not control. This is a little bit more like it. This I get. Guide. He's going, Ben, 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 Ben. Don't play C, play D. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it, I know that's music lingo, right? So it worked? Awesome. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. See, there's a choice. So, so the Holy Spirit's saying, Ben, 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 and I got to respond. Then, if you let him guide your life, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Do you see? Now this I get. And it's not control going like a remote control car, left, right, up, down. No, no. It's guiding, talking, leading, giving us desires. Like now the Holy Spirit's in there in the mix. So he's, he's, he's kind of putting things into you that you wouldn't really, like no one really wakes up thinking about evangelism before Christ. Before you got saved, did you wake up, man, I just can't wait to see what God's word has for me today. Nobody does that. Yeah, but Christians now, some of you doing that. That's kind of weird, right? That's not normal. Take a poll of the 70% that call themselves Christians. You're not going to see many of them saying, man, I just wake up. I, just, I can't wait to mine some goodies out of God's word first thing in the morning. That's not normal, right? But he does guide us and lead us. And he's, he's saying, hey, this would be good for you. He says, um, these two forces, angel, devil, see it? This is where it's biblical. It doesn't say angel or devil, but you see it right here. That these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. In other words, it's not just a, okay, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I embrace you as Lord and Savior of my life. Deliver me to glory someday. I'm ready to do it. I want to live for you and everything's fine and now everything's good. And I act just like Jesus all the time. No, what happens then just so you can understand the gospel with some clarity, is that that Holy Spirit of Christ comes to live inside of you. And at that point, he's now leading, guiding. He's giving you some, some promptings. Do these things now. Do these, this will be good. This will be good. I could use you over here to, to advance my kingdom. I could use you here. Be nice to your wife. Ladies? Amen. Oh, yeah. That doesn't come out too often. Come on now. If you want more of it, you've got to amen me. Okay? Wives, be nice to your husbands. Amen. Jared, I set you up like Karch Karai, buddy, and you just missed it. Wives, be nice to your husbands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some choices. It's a war. The angel and the devil, right? They're sitting there on your shoulders, and there's a war right here. I don't, I'm not a humongous... Joyce Meyer fan, but she wrote a book, The Battlefield of the Mind. It's so true. It's all going on right here. There's the devil and then there's God and they're sitting there on the shoulders, right? That's what it says. That they're constantly fighting with another. So you're not free to just like say, I'm, I'm a Christian now, so I'm just going to act like Jesus all the time. It's gonna, just going to happen naturally. No, it's not going to happen naturally. It's a war, and so you have to make choices every single day to, to stop and tune into the, the, the good voice and obey it. And that's why it says you're not free to just make 
All these great, easy, good choices. That's what Paul's victim, he, he's, vict, he's a victim of this. He's not making good choices. He's, he's listening to the devil on his shoulder and he's willfully giving into the bad voice. And so that's why we're not free to make easy, good choices all the time because we're not necessarily controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's in us, so he's controlling our destiny. But now there's a war and we have to make a choice. So if you read on in our text, which I didn't read with you, but if you, if in my Bible, I have to turn the page, and he says this, there's this, there's this uh, word there. It's just like the so now. And it's this, it's therefore. So like after all that we shared from Romans 1 through Romans 7 and now 8, up to this point, take all that in con into consideration. And because of all that, based on that, therefore, now he's going to tell you what you're going to do with what you just learned. It's not easy. It's a fight. You're going to have to make some choices every single day. And he says this, therefore, brothers and sisters, he's talking to Christians, right? He's talking to Christians. He says, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Remember, when you were, before you were a believer, wasn't it just so easy to sin? Like, you didn't even care. Like, you just did whatever you wanted. It didn't matter who it hurt. It didn't matter how much it cost. It didn't matter how much it hurt you. You didn't give a rip, right? But now he's like, no, 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 you don't have to do that anymore. It's different now. It's a whole new ball of wax. When you died and raised again, new person, old person's dead, new person's alive, and you no longer are under the obligation to do that sinful stuff. He's urging you to do it. Don't do it. He says, stand strong. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. Now, again, it's not die because what? Guess what? How many people are going to die? Everyone, right? We're all going to die. So it's not what he's, he's not talking about death in the grave, right? He's not talking about that. He's talking about something different. That's why it's a little confusing because he's saying death and die again, but he did that before, and before it was about death like in the grave, and then sometimes it's about the second death. We die like here, but then there's the second death where we're just going to either go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. But in this one, it's something different. You've got to take the context to see what he's talking about. He says, um, he says for if you live by the, the sinful nature's dictates, you will die. We're all going to die, so it can't be death in the grave. We also know that, that, that if you're in Christ, right, there's no condemnation, so you're definitely going to be in glory, right? So what does die mean here? Well, I don't know. Let's read on. He says, um, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. But, I love that, but if through the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now what he's talking about here, I believe, this is just my conviction. You don't have to agree with me. That's fine. I'm not God. But what I believe here is that he's referencing here what he talked about earlier about this miserable life that he's living. When he chooses sin, when he knows better, it torments him. And those of us that are now Christian that have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, when we do bad willingly, it hurts, doesn't it? It didn't used to. We didn't care. But now there's that thing inside of us. And so what, the, what, what Paul's saying here is, don't live my miserable life. Don't fall victim to that. Life meaning good. Like Jesus came, John 10.10, 10, that you might have life and have it in abundance. See, Paul doesn't want you to live his life of misery. He wants you to live Jesus' life of abundance. And how do we do that? Following the Holy Spirit rather than following the devil. And Paul, all too often, is falling victim to the devil's voice. And he's, and he's willfully saying yes when he shouldn't. And it's causing him to be tormented inside. And I get that. Anyone else get that? We all do, right? So that's all good information, but how do we fix that? We fix it simply by doing what God says to do. The antidote to the problem is this. He said early on in the scriptures, I place before you blessings and curses, life and death. Now choose life. <laughs> choose life. Make a good choice because they're on your shoulders and yet to make a good choice. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says to strip off our sin. You know how we strip off our sin that makes us mess up and not run the race well? It's a very simple solution, but it's not easy. But it's simple. He says, we strip the sin off of our lives by fixing our eyes on Jesus. What are your eyes fixed on? What are you thinking about? 
Do you think about the mountain before you? Or do you think about the one who created the mountain? That's how we fix the problem. When, when, when you realize the utter helplessness of humanity, that you can't fix your sin problem, you're destined for hell. But even in that, Jesus fixes what you absolutely cannot and solves your problem of problems. When you think about that, that's how you run the race with endurance. That's what makes it easier to follow the Spirit's leading when you know that Jesus is the right way. And when we're thinking about the gospel that saves us, it's easy to make good choice, easier to make good choices. Philippians 4 8, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise. Colossians 3 1 and 2, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not of earth. Amen. That is how you solve the problems. I'm done. I told you I didn't have a master plan here, so I'm just done. I'm going to ask the gentlemen who are going to come and give communion to come up here and join me. Harry's going to sing with us. He's going to lead us in worship to close out our night. So when we, what I'm going to ask you to do is when they start handing out your communion, I'd like for you to hold on to your communion elements and we're going to take them together as a family. And while Harry's playing some music, I'd like for you to do this for me. I'd like for you to just take a few moments of quiet before Kelly says a word. And I would like for you to just stop and do as Jesus has asked us to do. And that is before we take the communion elements, to do it in remembrance of him. To think about this amazing love that was displayed on the cross at Calvary where God sends his one and only perfect sinless son to pay for your sin that you might life. That is the greatest miracle in the history of the universe. I'd like you to think about that, and then we'll take communion together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, giving me the strength to get up here and do this. I'm sorry for uh, my crappy attitude. It is what it is. It's crappy. Um, thank you for getting me through it. Thank you for um, allowing me to have a group of people here that allow me to be myself. And Lord, I guess I, my prayer would be that um, our church would be that group of people that are, are just real, you know, just kind of authentic, not faking. Like, would you, would you help us to be a house that's um, where, where we feel safe to be able to just unload our garbage and, and not to pretend that, we're, that everything's okay? Like, I, I, I know today myself when, when Maury asked me how I was doing, I had to ask him if, if he wanted me to lie. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to be able to speak the truth. I want to be able to just be myself and not try to fake it. So I pray that this, that would be the spirit here in our, in our church. Thank you for your word. Lord, um, over the next couple of days before we get into the next area of Romans, I just pray that you'd give us all clarity on this section of Scripture because, I, you know, like, it's confusing. It, it kind of is. And um, I believe that what you've taught me is truth. I hope that I've shared it well. Um, but I just pray that you would minister to all of us in the days to come and share with us the truth of your word so we can understand you better, we could know you better, and therefore we could love you greater and serve you greater. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hello. Maybe I'll just speak a little. There we go. It's kind of a crazy thing to, uh, to have a, a little cup and a cracker. What a weird thing, right? Get together with people and have cracker and juice every week. But it's not so strange when you understand what's behind it. It's not so strange when you, when you really get it, what it is, what we are doing together, and why we do it together. And the, and the why is because of Jesus Christ. And the why is because we've all been affected by this God and man. And Moses just preached to us for what, a good half hour or better, about what that means, the gospel, the good news of what that means. And how, you know, everything isn't peachy. Everything isn't perfect. And I don't know if you're like me, I imagine you all are. I get buried in that not perfect sometimes, that not peachy. Life gets hard, crazy hard. I can't see my way out hard. Paul writes a little further on in chapter 8 of Romans. He says, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? kind of covers it, doesn't it? The gambit. So does Christ not love us if this stuff's happening to us? Of course not. A little further. He says, he is convinced that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's an amen. That's powerful. That's what we're remembering. This is part of what communion is all about. This is why we do this, and this is why we do it together. Because that message affects every one of us right in our head. We ought to remember it, and in our heart we feel that love, and in our hands, because we got to do something about it. So if you guys would, honor me, and let's do this together. Little cracker represents Christ's body, broken for us, out of love. Take it with me. The cup, representing his blood spilled for us to satisfy the law. Please take it with me. God, you are amazing. You sent your son to die for us. There's nothing that can separate us from the love that you have for us. You forgive all of our screw-ups, our mess-ups. There's no condemnation because of what Christ did that we're still going to be loved with you. Even though we constantly goof up, mess up, and trouble is everywhere. Yet your love endures forever and ever because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we just say, amen, and thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Uh, I wrote this song. It's called Broken. I just kind of want you guys to listen to the, the words.
And only you can fix me Yes, I'm broken And only you can heal my heart of stone Oh, here I am, Lord Just a man with a voice and a song Lord, I yearn to sing your praises all the day long. But my sin keeps me pain. Myself I condemn in shame. I forget your name and that you overcame. I am broken And only you can fix me Yes, I'm broken Oh, Lord And only you can heal my heart of stone I forget who you are that you are living in me For greater are you than he who wars against me I forget your name That you overcame the grave You and now I will follow you well, I am broken And only you can fix me Yes, I'm broken And only you can heal my heart of stone Raise me to life anew, Lord, I am found in you. Raise me to life anew, Lord, I am found in you. Raise me to life. And only you can heal my heart of stone. I am broken. And only you can fix me. Yes, I'm broken. And only you can heal my heart. Oh, stone, it's only you can heal my heart of stone. Only you can heal my heart of stone.
You guys are dismissed. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>